really great to, to be here. And um, what an incredible man of faith Peter is to allow me to speak when he's not here. <laughs> oh dear. Silly man. <laughs> he's lovely. He's lovely. Um, yeah, and uh, the brief that um, uh, Peter uh, gave me was um, uh, the topic that he's given me for today is prayer and fasting, uh, to speak on prayer uh, and fasting. And in the previous chapters um, to the one that we've uh, just had read, from chapter 8 onwards, just by way of um, uh, kicking off this, um, uh, this series, uh, etc., uh, a bit of background, uh, we read that Stephen was stoned for his faith. And from that moment on, persecution began for the believers of Jesus Christ. So the church is now, the context we have now, the church is now under persecution and is being dispersed around the world. All the, the Jews from Jerusalem have been dispersed and they're having to go all around the world. And the believers were scattered after the outbreak of the persecution um, in Jerusalem and uh, the good news of Jesus Christ spread to other Jews in other lands. Um, at this time, the believers also began the Jewish believers also began actively sharing the good news with Gentiles around the world, the non-Jews around the world. And in Antioch, um, which is um, where we find ourselves today, Christianity was launched on its worldwide mission. And there the believers began to aggressively preach to the Gentiles. And in Acts 13, verse 2, we read, um, that the believers were worshipping the Lord and fasting. They were worshipping the Lord and fasting. And pray, uh, prayer and fasting by the believers was critical in the planning and in the advancement of the early church around the world. And prayer and fasting are the focus of our teaching uh, this morning. Um, and if we're, if, um, if we're honest, I think in the main, fasting is a biblical principle that has probably been very much neglected in our generation uh, for many churches. And as I was preparing this, um, just these last couple of weeks or so, I was struck how much I have neglected this discipline of prayer and fasting uh, in recent days. Um, and it was a, it was a real wake-up wake call for me that I needed to begin to do something about this again. For many Christians today, the idea of fasting seems completely alien, or it seems something that only super spiritual Christians should do, or some uh, monks or whatever in some far off um, mountaintop. That that's only, it's for them. It's not something that we can incorporate alongside our daily lives. After all, it means that you have to starve yourself and inflict severe pain on yourself, doesn't it? Isn't that what it's all about? Well, it's no coincidence that Jesus began his life's ministry with a 40-day fast. That's how he began his ministry, Jesus. And in that time, Jesus was tempted by the devil uh, beyond what any of us could bear. And he overcame the temptations of the enemy and he defeated him through the discipline of fasting. John Piper um, the author and preacher says, if Satan had succeeded in deterring Jesus from the path of humble, suffering obedience, there would be no salvation. We would still be in our sins and without hope. Therefore, we owe our salvation to the faithful fasting of Jesus. Jesus began his ministry with fasting, and he triumphed over his enemy through fasting. And the question I want to put to us this morning, at the very start, is if he needed to do this, maybe we should be asking ourselves, well, what about me? How can I face the incredible challenges to my Christian life without sharing in the fasting of Jesus? Can we as a church experience the fullness of Christ's power and blessing without humbly seeking the Lord's fasting. Questions that I've been asking myself have come to me in preparing this, uh, this talk. 
I don't know much about the history of St. Barnabas. I'm learning to know and love more about this church every time I come. But my guess is that you probably have seen over the course of years, weeks, months, I don't know, some blessing. You've seen some converts. You've seen some transformed lives, I'm sure. But my question to you is, is that enough? Is that enough? Are you satisfied with that? Or do you want to see a flood of blessing? Do you want to see a huge outpouring of the presence and power of God in this church, in this surrounding area and beyond? Because if you're a Christian believer here this morning, then the fact is, the Bible says that God is your heavenly Father and that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords and nothing is impossible for him. And if he's your father, and if your father says that nothing is impossible for him, and if your father says he has power over all the works of the enemy, and if your father says that all things are under his control, if that's who he is, then I neither want nor expect to see a trickle in the work and the extension of his kingdom. I am expecting seasons of great flood. I am expecting a torrential outpouring, seasons of torrential outpouring of his spirit. And if we're not seeing it, then I would want to ask the question, why? Why? If this is true, if this is who your father is, and if this is what he is capable of, then why are we not seeing that? Maybe you are, and I'm oblivious of it, I don't know. If that's a, but if we're not, why? Prayer and fasting was pivotal to the rapid growth of the early church, and it remains, I want to suggest to you that it remains pivotal today. Preaching to myself here, first and foremost, we need continually to be petitioning God and crying out to him, Lord, show us if there is any offensive way within us and lead us in the way everlasting. We need to cry out, God, bless us. Lord, flood us with your blessing. We want more of you, Lord, more of your presence, more of your power. Lord, we can't do anything of ourselves. We need you. Lord, please give us more. In South Korea, the first evangelical church was planted in 1884 and the believers fasted and prayed fervently for God's spirit to sweep their unreached nation. It was unreached. 100 years later, there were 30,000 churches in South Korea from nothing. The population of South Korea now, I don't know what it is, these statistics were from a few years back, I don't know what it is now, but the population of South Korea comp uh, comprised of 30% evangelical Christians. Imagine if a third of Great Britain were evangelical Christians. Wouldn't that be brilliant as a starting point? <clears throat> the great preacher Charles Spurgeon commented on his church's prayer and fasting times, and he says this, Never has heaven's gate stood wider. Never have our hearts been nearer the central glory. My heart longs for us as a church to be nearer the central glory, to be so near the fire that we burn with the zeal of Jesus for his name and for this perishing world. To be so near the fire that we burn with the zeal for Jesus, for his name and for his perishing world. So my prayer this morning is that we will leave this place understanding the importance of fasting and that it is something that can be done by all of us, not by some super spiritual Christians only. And that we'll understand that fasting is not legalistic, but something that is voluntary and that God gives us a wide permission of how we fast, and that it is actually a joy which strengthens, or can become a joy, that strengthens and enhances our relationship with God, first and foremost. So I want to look briefly at three 
things about fasting. First, what is fasting? Why we should fast? And thirdly, how do you know when and what to fast for? So firstly, what is fasting? The Greek word for fasting is nestia, which means not to eat. But it's more than just not eating. Um, fasting can be abstaining from something that we really enjoy. You don't have to fast from food. You know, sometimes medically you will not be able to. But you know, uh, fast, you can abstain or fast from something that you really enjoy. Something that we would really miss if it was not in your life. You could be fasting, if it was music, fast for music for a day, two days a week, whatever you choose. If it's your favourite soap opera, maybe you fast from that. If it's tea, tea, if it's uh, fast from that. If it's coffee, if it's a particular night out, if it's alcohol, whatever it is, you can fast from it. You can deny yourself from it. So it's to deny myself of something that I would really miss and either give that time to pray or whenever I'm reminded of the thing I have chosen to deny myself, send up arrow prayers to God in regard to whatever it is I am fasting about. Uh, when I was more disciplined in, my, uh, in, 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 my, um, in the area of fasting, I would normally, um, I'm not a great one for um, uh, fasting from food. The most I would ever do is maybe miss a meal uh, or whatever in, in one day. Um, and I would fast maybe from other things, um, coffee or whatever else it was. But whenever I, I, I missed the thing that I was fasting from, I think, oh, right, it's time for me to pray. I would be reminded to pray. So I would be in a spirit of continual prayer throughout the day. As I, Every time I was reminded of, of, of missing whatever it was I was fasting from, I'd pray. So the whole day was saturated in little arrow prayers. Fasting denies my body, mind, or wants. And that reminds and prompts me to pray and seek God. Fasting is something that you do while carrying on with your everyday activities. So in a sense, your daily lifestyle becomes a constant prayer. One thing that we should uh, note here, that um, biblical fasting always occurs with prayer. Always. You can pray without fasting, but you can't fast without praying. When you fast, you have to pray. That's the whole purpose of it, to prompt you to pray more, even if it's just arrow prayers throughout the day. Biblical fasting is deliberately abstaining from food or other things for a spiritual reason, i.e., first and foremost, to communicate deeper with God on some matter and to deepen our relationship with the Father. To deepen our relationship with the Father. There's no legalism attached to fasting, God gives us marvellous freedom in the area of fasting. In saying that, Jesus does assume that his disciples will fast. In Matthew 6, speaking on fasting to his disciples, uh, he doesn't say to them, if you fast. Jesus says to them, when you fast. So he's expecting that they will be fasting. When you fast, blah, 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 do this, this, this. However, he leaves the choice of when to fast, the length of our fast, and the decision of how we will spend our time while fasting completely up to us. It's your choice. You tailor it to what you do. You set yourselves achievable targets, not something impossible that you can't achieve, and then you become discouraged and disillusioned. So far, fasting, what it is. Why fast? Well, when a man or a woman is willing to set aside legitimate appetite uh, the legitimate appetites of the body and the mind, and to concentrate on the work of praying, what we're doing is we're demonstrating that we really mean business with God. That we're seeking God with all our heart on a particular matter, and that we're really serious about what we're seeking God on. Joel chapter 2 says, Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart with fasting. So fasting, I want to suggest to you, puts things in proper focus. It's a physical way of saying food, uh, I think in Matthew it says man should not live by bread alone. So it's a physical way of saying food and the things of this life 
are not as important to me now as whatever it is I'm petitioning God for. Whatever it is I'm bringing before the Lord during my fast. Food and the things of this life are not as important to me now as this particular issue. Fasting reveals where your heart really lies. It confirms that we're ready to sacrifice anything, to sacrifice ourselves to attain what we seek for the kingdom of God. Jeremiah 29 says, God says, when you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you. Greater intimacy with God, a greater sense of the presence of God. Why fast? And thirdly, uh, um, what is fasting? Why fast? Thirdly, how do you know when and what to fast about? Well, basically, it's usually when you've been praying and waiting for something for a long time that hasn't happened. There hasn't been a breakthrough. We want to seek God, or we want to seek God in a more deeper and more intimate way. It is to say, Lord, I am desperate for you to hear me and respond to me in this area. Looking for a breakthrough here. Bless me, or please show me why it is you're not. Is there a barrier on my part that is acting as an obstruction? What to fast for? Well, it could be anything. It could be an illness, yours or a loved one's. It could be for protection. It could be because of, uh, it be, uh, be, uh, because of some hold or habit in your life that you're struggling to break free from. It could be problems or troubles that have befallen you or your loved ones and there seems no end in sight. It could be repentance from some, uh, some known sin in your life. It could be help to, um, uh, to forgive. Maybe you're holding on to unforgiveness and you just can't release. You can't break out of that and you just need help with that. It could be that uh, you, you want to petition God to change some circumstance in your life. Or it could be there's something you've been praying for, as I've already uh, said, for a long time and there's been no breakthrough. Or maybe there's an unbeliever you would like God to awaken to the spiritual things. You've been praying for them for weeks, months, maybe years. Maybe that's what it is that you need to fast over. Or is there a broken relationship you would like God to reconcile? Are you concerned about the direction of your life? Lord, where now? What is it you're leading me in? What is it you're calling me to do? Then that's what you need to fast about. If you are waiting for a breakthrough in any of these areas or similar scenarios, God may be calling you to rediscover the place of fasting and using it to tap into his power and revelation. So the reason for fasting is not something that comes up on the spur of the moment. <coughs> it's all about something that has been consuming troubling you and you're desperate to see a breakthrough so in a sense it's not something that you choose but something that chooses you now of course there, 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 are, there are other times when those in authority over us uh, proclaim a fast as was done by King Saul or Je uh, Jehoshaphat uh, but normally and ultimately that decision so that, you know you could be called to um, come to a decision that you, uh, you can be called to a um, a time of prayer and fasting as a whole church, and the leadership here does that, for example. But normally and ultimate, ultimately, the decision is solely between us and the Lord. So what is fasting? Why fast? Um, when and how do we fast? And finally, I want to close with this. Um, there's many other things that we can say about fasting, but these are just sort of tasters that I'm throwing out to you. But finally, I want to finish with this. Fasting does not negate our responsibility to be obedient to God. Obedience and fasting go hand in hand. We cannot fast and pray expecting God to bless us when there is known sin in our lives. It doesn't work. The people of uh, Isaiah's day um, thought that they could fast in disobedience and that God would still hear them. And in Isaiah 58, God says, 
on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and you exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarrelling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. You cannot continue in known sin and fast expecting God to hear you at the same time. Yes, God may reveal sin when you're fasting, and that's one of the reasons that we fast, but you cannot expect to enter prayer and fasting with known sin in your life and still expect God to move. We need to repent of all known sin in our lives, otherwise we're just wasting our time. We need to at least accept and see the need for repentance. We may feel helpless to change, but are determined to trust God to give us the strength and discipline to turn away from all that we know to be wrong. Lord, I, I know I need to turn from this, but I confess to you, I haven't got the strength to do it. I can't do it, but I'm telling you I want to, but I'm also telling you I can't. Please, will you come to my rescue? Fasting doesn't impress God to the point that he ignores our disobedience. So genuine fasting will always cause us to examine our hearts to make sure, as far as we are able to, that everything is right with him. Richard Foster says, More than any other single discipline, fasting reveals the things that control us. This is a wonderful benefit to the true disciple. It's a positive thing who longs to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. Anger, pride, bitterness, jealousy, strife, fear, unforgiveness, if they are within us, they will surface during fasting. The Lord will make that known to you. He will point it out. So we can rejoice in this knowledge because we know that healing is available through the power of Christ. The Holy Spirit always reveals something in you that he wants to do something about. So when he does that, it's a wonderful thing. It's positive. You may not like what he reveals, but it is a good thing and it's for your benefit. It's not to condemn you. It's to bring you back into a right and full and proper relationship with the living God. The Holy Spirit never condemns. He only convicts. The devil condemns. Condemnation brings destruction. Conviction brings peace, joy, and fullness and restored relationship. Big difference. Condemnation, you feel condemnation, you recognize the devil in it. Not God. You feel conviction, the Holy Spirit prompting you, saying, hey, I've pointed this out. Come on, we've got to sort this. Run with me. So fasting reveals where your heart lies. And John Piper says, when the heart proves to love God more than bread, i.e., bread being the desires and the wants of our natural hearts, Satan then does not have the foothold he would if our heart was in love with the earthly things. So when our hearts don't love the earthly things anymore, Satan hasn't got a foothold in your life. He can't, you haven't given him a door to come in. The people of God are often called to go without the ordinary means of life. Fasting is a brief, voluntary experience of this deprivation to prove our hearts. When we experience this going without, the Lord reveals what is in our hearts and what we're controlled by. So as we close and as we conclude this morning, there are many conclusions. What are we slaves to? What are our bottom line passions? Fasting is God's testing ground and God's healing ground. Fasting is a way of revealing to ourselves and confessing to God what is in our hearts. And the aim of fasting is that we come to rely less on food and our wants and more on God himself. That's the meaning of the words in Matthew 4, verse 4, when he says, Man shall not live on bread alone, 
i.e. our wants and our desires, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So every time we fast, we're saying with Jesus, not bread alone, but you, Lord. Not bread alone, but you. We want more of you, not just the wants and desires of our hearts, even though they may be good, some of them, but we want ultimately more of you. You is what we want first and foremost. So can I encourage you and invite you this morning to maybe begin to seek or look afresh at this whole area of prayer and fasting and allow God to reveal himself to you and you to yourself, maybe. John Piper, uh, Piper puts it like this. Long, long with a deep, joyful aching of soul to know more of his presence and power in our midst. Long with a deep, joyful aching of soul to know more of his presence and power in our midst. Can I invite you to stand, if you're able, please? And I just want to pray 